My guest this week is Dan Fellows, YouTube star and drinks consultant. You can check him out on YouTube. His channel is Dan Fellows Coffee Plus Cocktails or on Instagram at Dan Fellows One. He's the UK brand ambassador for Slayer Espresso Machines. He's a coffee consultant for Monin and was nominated for a Sprudgy for his YouTube channel under the category of Best Coffee Video Slash Film. Dan is the only ever person to win the World Coffee and Good Spirits Championship twice, and he's also won the UK Barista Championship, so he spent a lot of time in the UK coffee scene. For this week's episode, I've taken 40% of lactose-free goat milk, freeze-distilled it for 12 hours, and blended that with 50% whole milk and 10% coconut milk to create the most harmonious balance for this particular podcast. Please enjoy. Well, as Dan Fellows always says on his YouTube channel, let's get started. <laughs> let's make some coffee cocktails. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> welcome, Dan. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Three times UK in coffee, UK coffee in good spirits champion. Uh, one time UK barista champion, and two times world coffee in good spirits champion. Thanks for having me. Yeah, nice you're very welcome. Thanks for joining me. Uh, how did you get oh, yeah. started in competitions? Um, it's a very good question. I think it's probably before competitions that it really started. I'm quite a competitive person. Um, kind of grew up, always tried, not with other people, really. In fact, not with other people, other people at all, just with myself to try and do things I do to the best of my ability, I guess. So when I first started working in restaurants, kind of wanted to be a chef to begin with, which is kind of strange. But yeah, that was kind of where I wanted to go with things. And then when I turned 18, got moved to the bar, which was pretty cool. Started making coffee to actually, the place I worked was brewing coffee really quite well, considering it was quite a long time ago. Um, and had some really good mentors, learned how to make cocktails, wanted to kind of improve both aspects of what I was doing, because I really enjoyed it. And then decided a good way to do this would be to push myself and do a competition. And it was the best thing I ever did. So I would thoroughly recommend it. Amazing. So you started off being a competitive guy and you've always loved flavors and it just mm -hmm. kind of made sense to put the two together. Yeah, maybe not always loved flavors. I grew up in chicken nuggets and chips. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, I was quite fussy as a kid. And then as I got older, my kind of preferences changed and opened up. And I realized I've probably not been eating as much as I should have been uh, variety wise. And then, yeah, never turned back. I love it. So a what... flavor guy now yeah absolutely like especially i've enjoyed watching on your youtube videos the one you released just after manchester mm. coffee festival talking about seasoning and sort mm. of acids and stuff i thought, found that a really interesting video thanks did you want are you going to enter coffee and good spirits <laughs> uh i have concluded um post our chat that i'm not going to enter coffee and good spirits um i suppose this is quite uh, topical uh, well come on uh today they announced the rule changes for barista championship brewers cup etc and they allowed the use of alternative milks uh which is mm. one thing that had made me question competing in the barista championships again like i've been a vegan for a long time and i've competed twice in the barista championships as a vegan but using dairy milk and it Obviously, it doesn't sit quite right with me, and I can't really drink it anyway, even if I put my sort of morals to one side. And um, I had a chat with uh, Diana Johnston, who's been a head judge at Coffee and Good Spirits in the UK, and we were talking about the score sheet. And I thought I'd try and come up with some clever way of doing an Irish coffee without any actual cream, but it just wouldn't score very well. So I've uh, I've surrendered and decided to not do it yeah i mean hopefully they're on they're having a similar discussion around dairy cream um it's a bit more tricky in a way because you do have to float it on top of the drink but yeah. there are ways and i'm working on different ways so yeah that's uh upcoming content so stay tuned and then i will twist around into competing in coffee and good spirits okay if the that's if the mission. rules change i'll do it that's my promise to yeah. you all right that's a deal we'll shake hands through the screen <laughs> yeah, now, will. a digital so, handshake uh, no. yeah exactly but yeah, I think it's um, massive progress. I'm sure we'll come on to plant-based milks perhaps later down the line because um, it's not necessarily the feature of the talk today. 
but no absolutely. yeah it's uh, i think it's great progress absolutely so going back to you and your competition history what uh what year did you first compete in a uh, coffee competition um so i well when i turned 18 obviously i moved to the bar because it well not in not in my words but in the words of my boss you're able to talk to human beings like a normal human being so it's nice for you to be able to do that rather than being kind of confined to a kitchen where you only get to speak to a few people um and i really enjoyed hosting people making drinks for people making coffee for people and talking about all of those things as i still do apparently um and yeah moved to the bar when i was 18 spent three or four years really trying to learn as much as i could and then when i was 22 in 2012 uh entered coffee and good spirits and uk barista championship and i learned more in three months than i did in three years before it so it's a really good way to kind of fast track your learning um push yourself to levels you didn't realize even existed learn things you didn't even know you didn't know and yeah learned so much in those few months practicing then I kind of did the competitions and it was like a next level thing in terms of things I learned. And yeah, absolutely the best thing I could have done for my career at that time. Amazing. Started a bit of a uh, viral into competitions, which I don't regret at all. I love it. And uh, in 2012, that was the first time you won Coffee and Good Spirits as well, right? It was. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, so I won the UK championships and it was a much smaller competition back then. I think Dave spoke a lot about how far Coffee and Good Spirits has come, which I'm also very proud of. Um, there were a, hand few, a handful of competitors and, but only a handful, like four or five or six, I can't remember. Whereas now we have it sold out for 12 competitors or 15, whatever it is, pretty much straight away, which is really cool. Uh, but back then it was a different competition. I was fortunate enough to win the UK championships in my, first ever comp maybe i've done barista concurrently i think it was the same weekend in fact i think they used to happen almost exactly at the same time oh wow um and i was 22 like green as grass didn't really know what i was doing but kind of like that kind of being out of my comfort zone won the uk championships and then went to seoul in south korea as the uk champion and had the biggest disaster of my competition career and one of the biggest disasters of my life occur in the world finals which you don't need well, I definitely need to hear about it. Reveal all. <laughs> yeah, it sounds really lame, really, when I tell it, because uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's not important or it's not like a huge thing. But the knock on effects and the kind of stage in which it occurred was horrendously stressful. So I was lucky enough to make world finals, uh, which is the top six and was doing really well. was feeling really confident, probably too confident, to be honest. Um, you know, went in without being prepared for all the things that can go wrong, <clears throat> which I'd say is a mistake. Got to world finals, having been hanging around with a couple of Australian guys prior to this backstage, they were talking about how with an aero press, I should have brought a prop. You can have the aero press either inverted or not inverted. I was doing the inverted method, but they were saying if you were to cap the aero press, just push it down slightly, then you'll kind of release the air which, you know, at that time people claimed was better. You could release the air, just get the brew. Um, and I was like, cool, yeah, I'll do that on stage. I'd never practiced it before, which again, huge mistake. Never do things for the first time on stage or even for like the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth or seventh time. Practice over and over again. But I did it the first time on stage, but did not cap the arrow press. So there's me with an arrow press open inverted oh, not far no. off boiling water coffee floating on top i went to squeeze the air out of something which wasn't even a vacuum or anywhere near a vacuum uh knocked it down i'm doing this showing with my hands but i essentially spilt coffee into the cap of the aeropress mm -hmm. couldn't get the cap on coffee everywhere water everywhere i feel like the most stupid person in the world for doing this tried to call technical timeout, which was a bit embarrassing. Uh, and then the judges were just like, no, just no. <laughs> uh, carried on, eventually forced the cap onto the AeroPress, inverted it, brewed it, made an Irish coffee, and didn't come last. So I was pretty proud of that. However, that was when I kind of went back to the drawing board, kind of realized if I want to keep doing this to a high level, I need to really be prepared for every eventuality. And that's when I kind of took a step back 
tried to really build foundational skills and gain as much experience as possible and just be more comfortable on stage. So I kept competing in Barista and Coffee and Good Spirits every year, apart from one year in Coffee and Good Spirits, pretty much, right through till 2018. Always come in second, which was annoying, but also a sign of a lot of people who've gone on to do quite well in competitions, which I feel very lucky to have done. Spent a lot of time not winning, a lot of time improving, getting better, often doing Coffee and Good Spirits and Barista at the same time. Um, but then when they kind of separated out and I really focused on one, which was Coffee and Good Spirits, that's when things started to come together. Um, so anyone listening who hears two-time World Coffee and Good Spirits champion, you got to hear also six-time not even not UK champion, not winning these competitions, one time not winning the Worlds, you know, massive mistakes as long as you learn from them then the other things can hopefully come along with it. But yeah, it was a big learning curve and eventually it turned out pretty well. So it's a good journey. <laughs> yeah, like it's great to hear that perspective because like when people think of you or think of other people I've spoken to, like they see them as this champion, as someone who's done really well in competition and you have to understand the whole road of getting there. Like, yeah, you know, we th we talk about Dale Harris all the time. I think it was mm. nine times he competed in the UK Barista Championship before he won it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Claire's been slowly creeping up the rankings year after year. And you know, you were yeah. you were 22 years old. You were in a foreign country. You were on a stage. There was mm. a lot of pressure on you, uh, but it's it's all paid off. Yeah, definitely. And actually, in hindsight, not winning the 2012 World Coffee and Good Spirits Championship first felt like. The worst point of my career but it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me for my career because if i'd have won then i wouldn't have been mature enough or experienced enough to capitalize on it i wouldn't have been able to um meet the people i've met through carry on in competitions i probably wouldn't have done it again wouldn't have had the opportunities i've had to work with some amazing people and companies so yeah it would have been too much too soon and i think i'd have benefited more by not winning than I, oh i think i've benefited more by not winning but being better at what i do than if i'd have won then and been way too far ahead of myself you know yeah absolutely and so entering and winning for the first time in 2012 you continued competing won the uk championship twice and the world championship twice mm -hmm. and how has the competition changed uh you know in any way rules wise competitor wise how has it developed since the first year that you competed rules wise actually it's not changed much to be honest it is actually due a refresh um which i know they're working on there's lots of ways all competitions can improve and evolve over time um but in terms of the drinks actually delivered within that framework of the rules it's night and day like the drinks being served now are unbelievably technical Coffee is a super important ingredient, but a lot of attention is paid to other techniques and ingredients. Whereas in the early days, it was still like a really high quality for the time. But I think if you were to put drinks from 2012 into the competition now, you know, there'd be no, they wouldn't be anywhere near as successful as they were back then, just like all competitions. Um, a good example of that would be the latte art competition. Like when I did, Actually, I did the latte. I think I think it was latte and coffee and good spirits that first weekend. I don't think Barista was there. In fact, that's definitely right because I did latte and I did good spirits. And my latte is average at best, but a simple pour back then did really well. Whereas now, if you did a simple pour, there's no way you'd even be considered for winning. And I think the same applies to coffee and good spirits, but it's harder to kind of define because there's so much variation in the drinks served. But yeah, they're better now. There's more theatre, there's more kind of engagement with judges. It's more professional, it's more slick. And it's I think it's more fun. Like the the most underrated thing people don't talk about as much in well, in Coffee and Good Spirits specifically, is how fun it is. Like backstage at a Coffee and Good Spirits competition is the best environment you can possibly be in at a competition. Barista and brewers and latte are very different dynamics because A, there's no alcohol involved. But B, um, particularly barista, there's so much riding on it that it's very intense, very competitive. And coffee and good spirits is inten intense and competitive, but everyone's there to kind of support each other. There's a lot of alcohol kicking around from previous rounds. We have a good time.
I love it. Like, uh, trying to think back to the question you asked, the difference between then and now, huge, to be honest. Amazing. Yeah. Like, thinking about, as you said, all competitions have changed so much. So one quote that I like to bring up to people is when Tim Wendelbo won the World Barista Championship in the finals, mm -hmm. he's there like wearing a waistcoat and a bow tie. And he says, I'm going to try and pour a heart on your cappuccinos. And yeah. then like, fast forward to, I think it was maybe like three or four years ago, uh, Will Pitts was in the finals of the UK Barista Championship. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, this milk allows me to pour some sick latte art. And he poured like, you know, 12 yeah. tulips and then like a swan on the next one. And it's like, it's insane how in such a short space of time, the competitions have grown massively. Yeah, for sure. That was my, that was probably my favorite barista routine I've ever watched in person. And it was only beaten by what I think is the greatest barista routine of all time, which was Dale. So it was a strong year that year, 2017. 17. Yeah. yeah. Bulls yes. routine that year was great. All about fun and making competitions fun. And I got a lot of time for that. And then Dale just did, yeah, for me, the best routine I've ever seen. Particularly. Um, yeah, his routine at the UK Championship and the routine mm -hmm. at the World Championship were quite different. But, you Very know, so. so so many people before us have talked about it on this podcast and other podcasts yeah. uh dale's 2017 winning routine was like almost infallible it was so heavily based on literal science of what you're gonna get yeah it was great very object and actually there are elements of coughing good spirits that i like that are fairly objective um temperature is a big thing in coughing good spirits which is well not actually tested with tools but yeah, more objective than does this taste good or not. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to be said for objectivity and subjectivity. Speaking of that specifically, you recently put out a video with a hot Irish coffee and a cold Irish coffee. And uh, you can't yeah, serve a cold Irish coffee in Coffee and Good Spirits, right? Yeah, I think that's been um, taken out. Because I, I first saw that when Tristan Stevenson did one in his, in his book in 2014, 15, maybe. Um, and it's like delicious. And then I think Dave did one in, in competition. I don't know what year, which is really tasty. And it's just a nice kind of contrast between the two. They're wildly different, even though they're, the ingredients are the same. The proportions have to be different to maintain balance because obviously we perceive sweetness at different levels at different temperatures. But if anyone's not done that before, I'd recommend testing a hot and a cold Irish coffee side by side and how different they can be just purely on temperature. But yeah, outlawing good spirits, unfortunately, which for me is a shame. Well, maybe they'll bring it back. May who knows? Maybe, like you said, the rules need a refresh and we might see all kinds of interesting new twists. Yeah, this is true. This is true. So... Going back to Dan Fellows and his world competition winning routines, when you build a routine, do you start with a concept and then build drinks to fit that? Or do you start with an absolutely banging drink and work it into a story? Uh, that was the exact theme of my 2019 routine, in fact. Uh, so I did one of each for Coffee and Good Spirits in 2019 per round. And it varies, really. If I have a coffee that kind of blows my mind, I'll build a drink around it. And I still do that to, the, to this day. A big thing I'm going to do next year on the YouTube channel is take a coffee, taste it, see what I'm kind of inspired by, the flavors it has, the texture, et cetera, et cetera, and then build a drink based on that, which might be complementary ingredients, which bring out what's already there. It might be contrasting ingredients that kind of offset what's already there. Um, quick aside on that, the best best feedback I ever got from a barista routine to a coffee that tasted like strawberry, passion fruit, and cacao nibs, amongst other ingredients, I added freeze-dried strawberry, fresh passion fruit, and cacao nibs. And they were like, just fill in the gaps. Don't add what's already there. Add what's not there that would make it better. So I could have done three less ingredients and got a better result in the end and a better score. Um, so that's then the contrast is like you can add things. So that year I put salted molasses, matcha coconut cream and pineapple juice 
which were things that weren't in the coffee taste wise that complemented it and brought salt and umami and a little bit of acidity and texture um but then sometimes you might just have an idea for example the frozen natural experiment in 2019 where i wondered what would happen if you froze coffee cherries before processing in the style of ice wine and also blood oranges which tend to get very low temperatures which build up the compound called chrysanthemum so i read um and then through being very kind of fortunate to work with coffee producers quite closely Carlos and Patricia Poller and the team at San Antonio in El Salvador carried out the test. The coffee was like, everything was turned up to 11. So not necessarily better or worse, but everything that was already there as a red Pacamara was just bigger and louder. And like, when you're looking for a coffee for coffee and good spirits, that's exactly what you want. You want high intensity, high body, high sweetness. And then I built the drink around it using the other ingredients that kind of inspired the process. So. To summarize, both can work really well. Have an idea, choose a coffee that fits. Have a coffee, choose an idea that fits. And both can be really good. Excellent points. Do you think it's possible to compete in coffee and good spirits with a more sort of delicate and complex coffee? Or does it need to be a coffee which has bold, intense flavors? Um, can I slightly reframe the question? Yeah, of course. Well, delicate's tough because, you know, booze is big but to reframe the question can you compete with a affordable accessible coffee 100 percent, yes yeah do you have to compete with a very expensive uh nuanced rare exotic coffee 100 percent, no like the best coffee for the drink isn't necessarily the best coffee for drinking and the same applies to brewing so optimal brewing and optimal drinking sorry optimal brewing for drinking and optimal brewing for mixing are very different so you might pull a super tight, sour, bright, intense ristretto with like really thick body. But then if you're adding sugar and a little bit of salt and some other ingredients in the spirit, it'll balance itself out. Whereas as an espresso, it'll be like way too tart. Um, delicate coffees are tricky unless you're doing like a highball style. But I think as a general guide, higher intensity, higher strength, reasonably high extraction is kind of preferred over very delicate coffees because they tend to be more difficult to balance and get that kind of celebration of the coffee yeah makes sense uh another thing thinking about what you were saying before one of the best bits of advice you got given in the barista championships about the signature drink that was um mm -hmm. part of the rule changes that were released today it was sort of clarified that in the signature drink um i've not got it in front of me so i can't quote it exactly but it was saying um, <laughs> that the, the signature drink should, um, shouldn't should just be like a made up mm. version of the flavors that are already present in the coffee. Yeah, exactly. And I got that feedback in 2016. So it's good that the rules now actually show that. It's a bit of a lag, but <laughs> yeah, totally. Like the same applies if you're making cocktails, you don't just want to add you know, chocolate and nuts to a chocolatey and nutty coffee. You want to add things that complement it and bring it to a new level. So uh, for a little while, you spent some time as a judge in the barista championships. Could you tell me a bit about your yeah. experience and how you found that? Yeah, for sure. I think um, for, a, for a kind of long term competitor, if you want to become much, much better at what you do on stage, spend some time on the other side and be a judge because the thing i learned the most from judging was empathy oh sorry the thing i learned the most as a competitor who moved into judging from a competitive standpoint was kind of empathy like you need to relate to how the judges are feeling but also what they have to do the workload the notes they have to take the pacing the structure and if you've never judged you just assume they're like machines who can just you know, write everything down, catch everything, see everything, taste everything. But it's they're, they're humans. Like, we're all just humans trying to make other humans have a nice experience. And if you're kind of, you know, just given information after information, drink after drink, no time to kind of breathe and have some kind of negative space, then it's not fun as a judge. And if you're not having fun as a judge, it's hard to score everything well, because you don't have time to appreciate and enjoy everything. Um, 
I much prefer competing to judging, but that's just me. Um, but I would say spending some time judging was one of the best things I ever did for my competitive career. And actually, it was probably the turning point from going to Worlds in, well, WBC in 2016 to going to Worlds for Coffee and Good Spirits in 2018. Judging in 2017 was probably the biggest step up in terms of my performance because of the judging um, that I took. So, yeah, very, very valuable. Big respect for the judges as well. Like, it's hard. It's intense. It's a lot of responsibility. And they do a great job. And they get criticized probably more than they should because actually everyone's doing their best. And the frameworks they work within are challenge like challenging. But within those frameworks, the judges are, you know, on the whole, are fantastic and always mean well for the competitors. And actually, to competitors, as a bit of advice, the judges want you to do well. They don't want to be served bad drinks. They don't want you to be having a bad time. So don't be scared of judges. Just treat them like humans, which they are, and be nice to them. And don't worry too much about, you know, yeah. It's very easy to say don't be nervous. But as long as you're trying to give them a nice time, I'm sure they want to have a nice time as well. They don't want to be cruel. Usually. Yeah. And especially like I think now, like this year and recently, the judges in the UK are so approachable and like such a genuinely friendly bunch of people who want to see competitions like continue to thrive and to you know help build the confidence and skills of new competitors like there's a really great community and scene all around it yeah and they're choosing to be there right like generally it's a voluntary based thing they want to be there they want to be served nice drinks so yeah respect to them and you know enjoy your time with the judges you don't get that much time in that weird format of standing on a stage with a one-way conversation so yeah make it memorable and enjoy yourself Absolutely. Um, I'm just thinking on finals day of, you know, barista championships, you've got the same panel of judges, you've got six competitors, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of pressure on these judges to taste 18 different drinks throughout the day and mm -hmm. like fairly and accurately assess them. And yep. you know, it's a lot of pressure. So hats off to them. Definitely. Yeah. So Agreed. moving on. Would you say your success in competition has opened doors for you career-wise? Uh, yeah, for sure. But I think more importantly, it's made me better at the things that I do for a career. Um, yeah, like they complement each other. Winning competition definitely opens doors, whether we like it or not. Um, and that's a privilege. So if you get opportunities on the back of it, you should be grateful and make sure you don't kind of rest on your laurels because it won't last forever every time we get new champions there's more champions it's more diluted so you do really have to capitalize on your successes um when matt winton won in milan we shared a taxi home together and he was like what happens now and i was like it's kind of up to you really like you have to capitalize on this you won't you will get people knocking on your door with opportunities but you need to make sure you say yes to the right opportunities uh, no to ones you actually don't want to do, but you feel like you sh should because someone's offered. You know, you need to make sure you capitalize and do the right things. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely open doors. Um, but the skills you learn, I think, are more important because they'll last you forever. Whereas competitions over time don't wear off because they're still incredibly prestigious, but it just becomes further ago. Like, it's difficult for me. Like, if we were on this podcast now, and I was like, I was actually the 2012 UK Coffee and Good Spirits champion. And then I stopped competing. The effect of that is less than being more recent. But then I hope being able to share what I've learned through things like YouTube, through the kind of jobs I have, that adds value to kind of carry over from the competition. Whereas if you just do a competition and do nothing, it will wear off and people will stop knocking. So you need to make sure you make the most of it, I think. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Mm -hmm. So due to a weird timing and an anomaly, um, mm -hmm. you won the UK Coffee and Good Spirits Championship. Uh, was that, so for the second time, was that 2017, 2018? Uh, it was December 2017 for the 2018 season. Right. Basically. And 
And then because of the way the timings worked out, the next UK season kicked off before the World Championships. Yeah, so I, yeah. So Matt North had a baby, basically, <laughs> which was actually why it happened, I think, uh, which meant I won the 2018 UK Championship before, sorry, I won 2018 and 19 UK before I'd gone to Worlds for 2018. And then obviously 2019, um, which was great, really. Like, I felt like I had two shots at the target, which was pretty cool. Um, everyone, <laughs> particularly after the Worlds in Brazil, everyone was like, why are you doing it? Like, definitely don't do it. There's only one thing that can happen, which is you go down or at the very best, you stay the same, which is, I guess, uh logical in some ways but because i developed two distinct routines like i was saying earlier the coffee producers for my drinks for 2019 had gone to so much effort and you know taken the time and care and the cost and everything else to produce these coffees having one in brazil if i then didn't go to berlin in 2019 and present the drinks that i was really proud of that so many people had worked on i felt like it'd be a real misjustice and even if i didn't win at least i presented the drinks that we'd worked really hard on Everyone said, you have everything to lose. My view was, or I kept telling myself, I've got nothing to lose. I've already achieved like what I set out to achieve. Um, sorry, no, I didn't set out to be the world champion. I set out to do the best routine I could and the results just carry on. Um, but I'd already become world champion in Brazil, which is kind of the ultimate thing you can achieve. I figured I've done that. If I present these drinks and they like them, then that's zero risk because I'm just serving drinks that I'm proud of. And then obviously the results make it even better, obviously, but that wasn't the goal necessarily. Um, I thought it wouldn't be fair to not present these drinks after so much work had gone into them. And we're all very proud of them. It's a really nice way of looking at it. So you didn't feel, so for the, your second world championship, mm -hmm. sorry, your third world championship, the second time you won it, well, you didn't yeah. feel like an insane amount of pressure um because you were already the reigning champion like yeah so much I, I brazil was tough because it's such a different place um ingredient wise culture wise everything else berlin was like just it felt like a free ticket i was on stage really I, they were like the, that was the best routine i ever did i came off stage for the first time ever after what was like the most euphoric end of the routine with the music i got a shout out to lsfx because they cranked the music at the end and it was like the best moment of my competition career came off stage everything i set out to do i did everything i set out to say i did and everything hopefully tasted as it should have done and th at that point i was like well i'm completely done here because that's the best i can do everything went to plan you can't ask for anything more and that literally never happens in competition um and that was when i, I knew i was finished for that uh that run <laughs> you know i wasn't gonna enter again because i'd done exactly what i set out to do prior to the results and then the results after just were the biggest possible bonus but i didn't go there to be that like douchey guy who's like oh i'm coming to take my crown again no way i just wanted to do the best i could with the drinks we developed um and yeah finishing a routine content was just the best feeling with also like uh, but my fiance was there all my family were there all my colleagues and teammates were there all the sca uk were supporting like it was perfect for me as a competition crescendo for now for now well well if it <laughs> isn't for now what a way to go out right i was happy with it yeah and yeah. then that's that's even before the results so like if you set out to win almost well everyone apart from one person will fail whereas if you set out to get better everyone will, everyone will succeed because just by doing it you become better at what you do so with that intention you will guarantee success whereas if you aim to win it's a pretty slim chance you win you'll win really and you probably won't because you're focused on the wrong things awesome so you had like two distinctly different routines year after year did you after winning the championship the first time did you change how you prepared for the second world championship um 
your colleague Nicola will know I'm a list guy. So I had even tighter lists that were more comprehensive. If that's your kind of way of working, I think it's really powerful because everything that's in your mind, you can transfer to a spreadsheet or check sheet, whatever it might be, so that all that's in your head is like emotions and, you know, general being nice and presenting well. Whereas if your head's full of all the things you have to do, it's very difficult to be relaxed on stage. Um, so I did that, I think, to a pretty high, or like I did that very pretty comprehensively is what I mean in Brazil. It was even more comprehensive in Berlin, but I didn't, I don't think I've really changed my approach to competition from how I approach it ever. I've just developed it year on year to be better. Um, one thing I would say is I always build routines long term. So don't aim, don't build a routine for the kind of heats. Build a routine that you eventually want to serve in the world finals and then, you know, grow that and cultivate that. If you do a routine that you think is good enough to get to the next round, it probably isn't, um, which many competitors have shown by being kind of blasé about heats. Um, and that's always been my approach, which I've kind of learned over time. So I think that's definitely how I've changed it. Always aiming for the best I can possibly do and building towards that rather than building separate routines round and round. I think that's a really good piece of advice. I completely agree with you on that. Uh, and it's like little nuggets of advice like that, which are actually super useful because especially in the Bristol Championships this year, there's 70 spaces open to competitors uh, for the heats. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of people who want to be the top 14 to go to the semis. And yeah. you need to make sure that your routine is definitely better than good enough. Yeah. Do we um, want to go down the rabbit hole of preliminary courses and preliminary rounds? Yeah. I can tell I me. Can... <laughs> I strongly uh, disagree. And the SCA UK know, know this. Uh, I completely understand the format of the preliminary round, which is two espressos, two milk drinks. And I think it's fantastic to be accessible for as many people as possible. However, I think it makes it more daunting uh, to then have to build a signature drink, having had no feedback on it at all. And baristas think, I think baristas definitely consider the signature drink the hardest course to do well on. So yes. I think um, the, the prelim... Preliminary is that's the right wording, isn't it? Compulsory or preliminary? preliminary. Um, I think Heat. either works. Heat. Yeah. So the the non signature drink approach is what I'm saying. That's by far to most people in my experience the most daunting course. So to get through to top fourteen with no feedback on a signature drink, I think is a challenge. And I think the more points of feedback we can give baristas on every course, the more likely they are to improve their skills. Um, that's a good point I just made to myself. If you don't even practice a sig drink, you won't be very good at sig drinks. Whereas if you make one, at least you've learned from it. Um, and also, if we're ultimately looking to breed the next generation of success in the UK, as many touch points as we can give to give feedback on every course, I think is really valuable. And in order to get through to top 14 with two espressos and two milk drinks, A, you have to have a very expensive coffee to stand out, stand out, broadly speaking. More expensive coffees tend to score higher, which makes it less accessible. Uh, you're depending a lot of your success on the equipment because we all know grinders can be a bit rogue on stage, going from backstage to on stage. If you're relying on that for just one, literally one shot, one double shot for your espressos, might run a bit quick, might run a bit slow. If your grinder misbehaves, you could be done and you could have been the future world champion, you know? Um, there are my arguments against it. I completely understand the arguments for it. That it's more accessible is the argument. Um, but I just think giving people chances to work on their weaknesses is way more important than, well, sorry, I think giving people chance to work on their weaknesses is more valuable than not giving them that chance. But I do understand people might not enter because they have to do a sick drink. But ultimately, they will have to anyway. So that's my point. And it's a good point. <laughs> like it's, it's good to hear different point of views on how it is. Yeah. I think 
Uh, I see where you're coming from and I see where the SCA is coming from. And I'm not entirely sure which is the best route. Like you said, I, I get that it makes it easier to have quicker routines and get more competitors mm -hmm. through. But the first time mm -hmm. I did barista was 2018 and it was still the, you know, full routine for the heats. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, 15 minutes on stage, four espressos, four milk drinks, four cig drinks. And I would say I got a lot more out of doing that than I did when I competed this time in the heats and it was just two espressos mm -hmm. and two milk drinks. But, you know, we're taking a 15 minute routine down to seven minutes and you need maybe two less judges. I think make it 10, do two of each drink, because the point I'm making is to make high score in espresso in competition, you need a very expensive coffee to make a high score in routine across three courses, one of which is a SIG drink, which doesn't need to be super expensive coffee, nor does it need to be super expensive ingredients to be good. The net cost can be much lower. The creativity is higher. The feedback loop is stronger and it's three extra minutes or something. No more judges, more practice for judges as well. Like judging SIG drinks is hard. Like the, by nature, you need practice to be good at doing something. So judges could come in for the heats. They could have lots of shadow judges because there's only two scoring judges. Um, I just think the SIG drink so hard for so many people. And pretty much one of the big goals of my YouTube channel, which I'm not just plugging, uh, is to share techniques and tools that can be used for SIG drinks because there's so little information out there. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like when I got found out I was through to the semifinals this year and I had to build a signature drink, I was like, oh, where do you start? Like, it's it's such a deep rabbit hole you've got to go down. I had a competitor who's one of the, like, one of the best competitors in the world. Like, they've done extremely well in Worlds. Send me a message just being like, I'm not sure where to start with a SIG drink. And I'm like, you're one of the best in the world. It's so hard. Like, it's you, the more chance we get to practice these things, I think the better. And I think ultimately it'll make it more accessible because you don't just need a super high scoring coffee to do well. You need some kind of creativity. But anyway, that's that rabbit hole. Let's emerge. We're back. We can emerge <laughs> from the rabbit hole into um, yeah. a series of lighter questions. Um, Great. What's, what's your favorite song to put on your competition playlist? Um, I don't even know. The, the, yeah, my favorite moment on stage was with this crazy euphoric song, uh, but I don't even know what it's called. I think it's called like Meeting Euphoria. And that, that gives me like, uh, you know, the funny tummy butterfly kind of thing, because it was such a fond moment. Uh, I always laugh when I hear the XX intro, because just everyone uses it. Uh, I don't know. Bonobo. Lots of. Uh, also, Wrong side of the bed, potentially. Yeah, a tray you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I still have my Barista Championship playlist saved on my Spotify, and occasionally, like, it comes on in the car, and I'm like, mm -hmm. it. All of a sudden, you're like right back there on stage. Like, if you've right. listened to these songs so many times in this order, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I need to be serving the milk drinks now, or oh, I've stood in the wrong yeah. position on the stage with this song kicking and also, in. Don't like my least favorite song for competition is my panic song from the first year, which was Bill Withers, uh, Lovely Day. Not Billy Withers, Bill Withers. Because uh, every time that comes on, it came on a minute before my routine finished. And it's your panic song. You know, you need to get a shuffle on. So whenever that comes on now, I'm not having a lovely day. It stresses me out. Yeah, my, I a panic song. <laughs> my idea was to not have a panic song, but to have a song to really get me pumped for the last few minutes mm. so it's kind of like bring the yeah. energy up in the room fit and surf the wave of vibes i guess yep. so we'll use a pretty heavy metal song by atreyu in ukbc 2021 was it 21 uh 22 yeah last most recent one yeah 20 22 yeah. um i was forgetting what year it was not when it was um yeah heavy metal song i'm all for it love it and, you know, it's nice for the judges to hear something a bit different, get the audience excited. They've probably heard, yeah, exactly. you know, the Bridgerton strings all day. And yeah. yeah. Agreed. I loved it. 
Um, so a question I didn't ask you when we spoke at Manchester Coffee Festival, um, but you, mm -hmm. you told me you'd love me to ask you, what's your guilty pleasure? Did I ask you to say that? <laughs> um, I don't know, really. Uh, I can't remember. I must have had an answer in mind when I asked you to ask it. I can't remember. Um, pass. Pass. Dunno. Dunno. I, okay. like I, I don't mind a bit of wrestling. I don't mind a bit of wrestling every then, now and then, just to uh, go back to nostalgic days, circa nice. two thousand and one. Well, that's what I watch when I'm packing down after filming, usually, because my brain's done all of its work, and it's usually like midnight. So I'm like, just go back to childhood, right in between us. Vintage Wrestling. uh, WrestleMania on in the background. Oh, the Undertaker's won again. I know. There you go. Um, okay, let's uh, let's spin the guilty pleasure. Is there a a certain type of alcohol that you think is not very cool or bougie and uh, you actually absolutely love it and it's seen as quite like not a trendy cool spirit. Mm. The problem with alcohol is I like all of it pretty much apart from Sambuca which I hate. Uh, my New Year's resolution in about 2010 was never to drink Sambuca ever again and every time I smell it I'm just like just makes me gag. I even put star anise in a drink recently, and even then I was like, this is taking me back. Um, but like all alcohols, cool in moderation. If it's sweet, that's fine. There's a time and place for that. You know, I'm okay with everything. No judgment here. You drink what you enjoy to drink. Nothing's uncool. Nothing's well, uncool. There are, there are a few things. What, what's your guilty pleasure drink wise, Will? Oh, uh, if we're talking um, a sweet, spirits, have a, have a sweet tooth. I have a semi-sweet tooth. I'll tell you what I absolutely love, though. Jägermeister. Mm. Yes, I'm fine. I hate I hate Jägermeister. Love Jäger bombs. Uh, <laughs> I met my fiance at a bar. Challenged her to a game of rock paper scissors. The loser buys the Jäger bombs, and now we've got a child and another child on the way, and we're going to get married. <laughs> I'm fond. A perfect match made by Jägermeister. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan. Um, what coffee are you drinking on Christmas Day this year? Ooh, on Christmas Day. Um, I've been dialing in some coffees from Obadiah in Edinburgh, which are fantastic. One's a Thai coffee with a really unique process that I've never tried before. Really... Uh, De like really delicious but really challenging and i like a challenge it took a bit of uh dialing in uh so probably that because i like something a bit different nice. but i've got a few christmas coffee in. um yeah all sorts i just check it in the freezer i'm a bit low maintenance when it comes to freezing coffee i just throw the whole bag in the freezer and then just grab what i fancy that morning just write the grind size on the bag and is that a tip is that a bad tip i don't know right the grind size the on the bag yeah just a library of coffee there's you also a, there's also a lamb leg there's a lamb leg on top of our bags of coffee at the moment <laughs> which is stressing me out <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a, a bag of frozen chips on on top of mine nice potato Free... defect yeah there's definitely a a, a joke there <laughs> uh Sorry. so that's, that's all good what are you uh what are you working on at the moment or like what have you got coming up that you're excited in the new year um personally having a baby in march to join our little boy which is gonna be really cool so boy and a girl. uh thank you which is really cool um i'm gonna be focusing on a few things obviously my kind of responsibilities with the companies i work for along with my youtube channel is going to be getting a lot of time I've got a few other courses coming out on different platforms, which are going to be very exciting. Um, fundamentally, just sharing the things I really enjoy learning, basically. I really like kind of learning about Espresso and I work with Slayer, so I get to share information about Slayer. I work with um, some really cool brands, Monin, Baxter Story, and get to spend time with these people doing very cool things. 
and then with my own stuff the youtube stuff is just something i really really enjoy and i think uh i did competitions for such a long time then i stopped then the pandemic happened and i started working with slayer so i was continuously learning things and i think the youtube channel came at a perfect time to continue learning things and sharing things on a stage platform that isn't a competition but is comparable in terms of having to push yourself to learn things if you say something on stage or on a youtube video you've got to believe in it and know it's true um so doing more of that and kind of yeah learning how to make coffee as well as i possibly can cocktails as well as i possibly can and coffee cocktails as well as i possibly can is my Excellent. plan for next year well it seems it. like years of competing in coffee and cocktail competitions has given you a very good skill set for building a youtube channel which teaches people how to make amazing <laughs> drinks right i hope so it's um i consider it my hobby and my job which is a very fortunate position and i think without competitions i wouldn't have that uh very fortunate opportunity to share these things because they'd be like it's just a guy in his kitchen whereas having done competitions potentially adds like a level of credibility or at least you know i've done these things in an arena outside of my kitchen so yeah it definitely gave me that opportunity amazing well was there anything else that we didn't talk about that you were hoping to get off your chest or any super secret insights or tips you had squirreled away should we topically talk briefly about plant-based milk and competition we can topically talk about plant-based milk and competition um do you have any hot and spicy takes are you happy are you, what are you thinking i'm all for it i think it's fantastic i think it's overdue i thought it was funny that um the rules stated all animal and plant-based milks are essentially allowed but not human milk which i thought was quite funny because it's arguably the most natural for humans to consume babies granted but i didn't think it was funny they specified that for the milk drink i wonder if it'll come into like sig drinks and should i say this yeah i think it's fine i've tried breast milk as a milk drink and it's really hard to pour good latte up so don't think people <laughs> choose it anyway so on that alone the fact that it's difficult to pour latte out don't bother yeah no uh it's like very sweet very watery soy milk uh i should say emma was on antibiotics at the time so our little boy couldn't have that particular batch so i was like well you know i'm a flavor guy gotta taste these things <laughs> i hope emma doesn't listen to this I might be embarrassed but yeah i tasted it you're definitely going to drop me a message after this and be like well can we remove the bit where we talk about the breast milk no i think it's fine well i just put that on my instagram and every single person who's messaged in fact look every single oh, person who's no. messaged back was like i've tried it uh i've uh, in fact i shouldn't i won't know that's funny uh every message is like i've tried it so maybe we should normalize it i don't know we should destigmatize it for sure well i guess as you said it's definitely more natural for <laughs> yeah. humans to consume than cow's milk but this yeah. podcast does not exist for me to um spread my vegan morals um across the airwaves so we'll just leave it no, hanging. it's strange to um, it's strange to specify now i could be wrong with the exact wording but i think all animal milks are now okay apart from humans and all commercially available plant-based milks are okay so we could be getting like goat milk we could be getting dog milk cat milk but not human <laughs> next year <laughs> unless uh, there's a rule addendum i i hope no one's serving cat milk and dog milk lattes <laughs> those poor <laughs> judges we will we will lose so many judges yeah it's a random one isn't it it's very it, this is the whole problem with rules like you can't outline everything but yeah i would have thought it would be cow's milk or plant-based commercially available I'm surprised uh, they opened up the other animal line of inquiry. Be interesting to see what people do. 
Yeah, I wonder if it's um, a question I need to ask, if it's allowed and if we'll see people blending, say, like 50% coconut milk yeah. with 50% cow's milk. Love that. But I also think coconut milk is such a strange one to allow because it's such a strong flavor. They say unflavored milks, but it's by nature a strongly flavored milk alternative. Yeah. But, oh, well, yeah. I'll just say it. Imagine... People might do this. They can beat me to it if I were to compete. Like a super tropical pineapple-y, passion fruity coffee with either oat or whole milk for a kind of neutral blended with a bit of coconut. Might ask you to edit that out later. Okay. But, you know, that could be my free one for the world. I think that'd be delicious. I think it would be. Like, you know, a really pineapple-y coffee. Pineapple and coconut. Yeah. Uh, what then, a dream pair. And then we're moving into the... Yeah, but then we're moving into the flavoured coffee debate. Um, at what stage is it therefore flavoured? I don't know. I think it opens up really exciting opportunities, basically. I think there's some weird stuff that might happen. I don't think people will serve dog or cat milk, but I think being able to blend or uh, choose new milks is fantastic. I'm all for it. Yeah, as am I. Opening up that door. It's going to be great. Great. So, um, yeah. Like an unexpected tangent, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting uh, that one at the end, but it's you know it is it's very topical. Um, have you read mm. all the the new rule changes? Then I skimmed through the summary of changes. Um, yeah. I like them. I think they're good. I think de-emphasizing some of the six pointers into two threes is good. Um, Remind me some other key changes. I'm just trying to think. I've not got it in front of me anymore. Yeah, so there was, um, the, like you said, the scale change. Some of them are now 0 to 3 yeah. instead of 0 to 6. Um, there was some, like, clarifications that were, like, you can start without yeah. your port filters in the machine. At the World Championships, mm -hmm. you can have different temperatures on different group heads. Mm. Yeah, I think that's cool. I think the one that um, is challenging... The, I think the thought comes from the right place to build community and teams. But I think the wildcard one is always a tricky um, thing in WBC because someone who comes 21st could beat the person who came 16th. However, that's produced some of the most magical moments I've seen in comp. So, yeah, I just wouldn't want to, I just wouldn't want to finish 16th in WBC and then not get to top 16. Yeah. So I can see both sides of that. No spicy takes here. No spice. <laughs> uh, I'll drop some spice. There's a rule change that I don't like. Go on. Um, one of them says there will be no plug sockets available backstage for competitors. I've not seen that. That's yeah. very silly. So if you've got your own like special freezer that you need, or like it says they'll provide a fridge and they'll provide a freezer. But if you've got things that you need to keep plugged in, um, mm -hmm. it's going to be tricky. That's just going to go rogue, and people have freezers and like staircases and stuff. That's on. That's like very difficult to manage, and it puts more pressure on the backstage team who are, again, under a lot of uh, pressure and time constraints themselves. To be monitoring plugs is pretty tough. Yeah. I don't like I don't like rules that stifle creativity. I like them that kind of open things up and make it more creative. Yeah, absolutely. They'll just be like generators back there. People will have to pay <laughs> to bring a generator backstage, won't they? Yeah, it's a good point. Like the rules do make mention to competitors being allowed to have as many battery powered devices as they want. Right. It's going to be people running right. like mini freezers off car batteries and stuff. Yeah. It must be the fuel crisis. I wonder if that's actually factored into it. Maybe. Don't know. Get British Gas to sponsor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We digress. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. I didn't see that rule, uh, but I think that's a very poor change if if it's yeah actually enforced. Well, hopefully, um, I'll have a a couple of chats and get some more clarity. And like they were only just announced today, so I think we'll be finding out a lot more i'm assuming the uk chapter will announce like which rules they're gonna you know imply this year 
Yeah, it's 2022 rules this year yeah. is what I understand it. Um, I wonder if that'll be the same national uh, globally on a national level. I thought it was interesting Australia aren't running a, a national championship this year. Are they not? What's time. happening there? Um, um, they said they don't have time or resource to run it to the level they No, they can. Given that it's in June. Um, yeah. therefore they won't be they won't be putting a champion forward, which I think is a shame. I think um if you're not gonna run a national championship, I think the reigning champion and then down working down the list should be given the opportunity to compete in the next world championship. Yeah. Particularly um Anthony won WBC, so he should definitely well, I, I suspect he maybe wouldn't want to do it again. But then whoever came second, the I forget the um competitor's name, but I know Angus came third. What an opportunity to get to WBC, especially if they're not running a championship. Yeah. It's a it's a shame. You know, the country that have have the reigning champion aren't entering this year. Exactly. Whereas yeah. just across the Tasman Sea, New Zealand are a whole year ahead with their champion. Is that right? So they've that. got they've got That's their cool. champion who's going to be competing in Athens, but they've also already got their champion who's going to be competing the following year. Wow, fair play. That's and then yeah, because like I think the next New Zealand Barista Championships might be in like March or April as well. So they're for some reason just fully on it. Well, as someone who had the luxury of time between nationals and worlds, I think that's fantastic. You've got so much time to improve your skill and your routine to the highest level possible. I think that's awesome. Maybe not too much time, but yeah, having time to prepare is so important. And also having, uh, I think it was about two, three months between nationals and worlds for WBC in 2016. I definitely didn't build a routine to the level I could have done with more time. So yeah, I think that's great. Good for awesome. them. Really good for them. Well, thanks for chatting to me, Dan, about all things competition and some things not quite competition, but My, it was uh, awesome. Thanks for having me on. And I think we should, I should say on behalf of all your listeners, thank you for doing what you do because us competition nerds love it. So, yeah, I appreciate it. I'm, I think it's a, a gap in the market that should have been filled a long time ago because it's a really valuable thing to talk about. So I'm really glad you've done it and do it at such a high level. Oh, so, thank you very much, Dan. Great feels uh, very full of Christmas spirit as we're only three days away from Christmas at time of recording. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But no, it's important to point out good work, right? So we, we all appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was really great catching up with Dan all about his experience and success across so many competitions. We originally did a live version of this podcast at Manchester Coffee Festival, but due to some technical issues, we had to re-record it in the classic style. Thanks for listening. You can check Dan out on Instagram at danfellows1. I'll also follow him on YouTube, Dan Fellows Coffee Plus Cocktails. And you can keep up to date with what we're up to by following at Taylor's Discovery on Instagram. Uh, Hello Judges podcast on Spotify, Apple, all the usual podcast places. As always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Time. <laughs>